Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman, and I would like to welcome you to the Georgia Tech course EC 2026, Introduction to Signal Processing. When I first joined Georgia Tech in fall 2001, my first teaching assignment was a couple of recitation sections of EC 2025, which was an earlier version of what we now call 2026. 2026 is based on a curriculum pioneered by my colleagues Jim McClellan and Ron Schaefer, and they got the idea to teach digital signal processing as the first course in electrical engineering instead of the usual course on electric circuits. Budding young engineers of my grandfather's generation were motivated by things like crystal radios. Modern students have other things in mind. To do lab experiments with electric circuits at any level of depth, you need some specialized equipment. But to experiment with DSP, all you need is a laptop. There is a textbook for the class. The second edition has some material on the discrete time Fourier transform and the discrete Fourier transform. And yes, those names are confusing. We'll talk about that later. Anyway, that material on the DTFT and the DFT is covered in the second edition of the book and not the first edition, so you do want the second edition. Although I should mention that you can follow along with these lectures without the book. Of course, if you are taking this class for credit, you want to acquire the book. There is a related book called Signal Processing First that we used in 2025, which doesn't have the DFT and DTFT material, but it does have material on things like continuous time convolution and the continuous time Fourier transform that we don't cover in 2026. Those are now covered in the follow-on course EC3084. There is a website for the DSP First curriculum that has all kinds of goodies. I'll leave a link to that in the description below. We use MATLAB in the course. If you're a student at a university, you likely have access to an educational license of MATLAB. If you're a Georgia Tech student, you definitely do. But if you don't have access to a MATLAB license, that's okay. You can do a lot with the open source program Octave. Although, for the most part, the GUIs and the specialized toolbox we've created for this class will only run in MATLAB. So we think of a signal as something that's carrying information. So the voltage that's coming from the microphone into my audio interface as I'm recording this lecture, that's carrying some information. I'm thinking about that as a signal. That's different than the 120 or 240 volts. 60 hertz or 50 hertz alternating current you have in the wiring of your house. Because although that is providing power to do work, we don't think of that as carrying information. In this class, we're primarily interested in signals that are functions of time, such as acoustic signals like speech or music, and these might have an intermediate representation in terms of voltages. Or you might have a function of space, such as the selfie you just took with your cell phone. In the case of video, you have a function of time and space. You could also talk about neural patterns. You might be trying to detect the onset of an epileptic seizure. Or you might be thinking about radio waves. In all of these cases, in the real world, you have functions of a continuous time variable or continuous space variables or both. In order to put these things inside the computer, you have to digitize them. You have to discretize those functions of a continuous variable and turn them into numbers inside the computer. And once they're just numbers inside the computer, then you can run algorithms on those numbers. Examples from image processing include things like image sharpening and image deblurring. The deblurred image here shows some artifacts, but the fact that this is possible at all, given this original blurred image, is pretty amazing. Now consider this audio example. We can use digital signal processing to lengthen the duration of the music without altering the pitch. That particular example demonstrated some artifacts in the result, and one area of research is to try to find better algorithms for doing this task. You could also change the pitch without altering the duration. 
You may have seen some YouTube ads about programs that will take one voice and make it sound like a different voice. One such company is called VoiceSwap, and it actually creates its models in collaboration with the vocalists that they use to create the training data. And unlike a lot of companies in the AI music space, they actually pay royalties to these artists. I'll leave some links to some other examples of audio processing in the description below. You have most assuredly heard the digital signal processing algorithm known as Autotune, for better or for worse. Here's an example of a pure sinusoid at 440 hertz. This is the note A above middle C. Now we're going to change the frequency of the sinusoid in order to play a scale. That's kind of grating. Let me play it again. The reason it sounds grating is that pure sinusoids don't naturally occur acoustically. You can create them with a tuning fork, but that requires some work. So we're not used to hearing individual sinusoids. But more interesting sounds, all the sounds you're used to hearing, can be described by summing up a bunch of sinusoids of different frequencies. Here's an example of a trumpet note. Here's an example of a pure sinusoid with the same fundamental frequency. That has the right pitch, but it doesn't sound a whole lot like a trumpet. That fundamental frequency, that you can see here. This is a spectral plot that shows how much energy is at different frequencies. So the sinusoid that I played here, that corresponds with this spike here. Let's add in six more spikes. So that sounds a lot more like a trumpet. Notice though that the original trumpet note had a little bit of vibrato, and that's not really incorporated here. So that would require a little more work. We'll talk about all of this more later. To a large extent, you can think about EC2026 as an extended meditation upon sinusoids. Here's a fairly famous sound that starts as a group of sinusoids that are close together in frequency, and then they gradually spread apart in frequency and slide towards final destinations. You'll find DSP and metal detectors and medical devices like cochlear implants. Jim McClellan, along with his colleague Wayman Scott and their students, used DSP to detect landmines. And my colleague Pamela Boddy and her team have been working to improve the sound quality of cochlear implants. Digital signal processing is essential in some medical imaging technologies like X-ray tomography and magnetic resonance imaging. I'll talk a little bit about how MRI images are formed in the next lecture. Take a second and see if you can figure out what this is an MRI of. There you go. These are my colleagues Rob Butera and Chris Rizal. They spend a lot of time thinking about neural signals, both thinking about how to use ideas from this course to model the underlying behavior of neurons and how to use DSP to process data from neurons and EKGs and EEGs. Telephone communication systems were obviously originally all analog, but nowadays everything is digital. When you call someone on your cell phone, DSP is used to encode your voice into the signal that's broadcast over the air, and on the other side, DSP is used to reconstruct your voice from that data. Whenever you make a Zoom call, DSP is being used for echo cancellation and for background noise reduction. DSP techniques are also used to analyze financial data. Real-world data is extremely complicated. The main idea of this course is to be able to take this complicated data and decompose it into simpler components. And this decomposition makes it easier to analyze and understand the data and then process the data in order to do whatever task we need to do. Luckily, the math we develop is not application-specific. It can be used in a wide variety of areas. Here on YouTube, I'm mostly known for my lecture videos on analog electronics. 
And I do love circuits. I love thinking about circuits. I love analyzing circuits. I love designing circuits. And I love building circuits. A manly massive passive equalizer is a beautiful thing, but it does this one thing. Once you've built a circuit, that's what it does. If you're using digital signal processing, then you have an algorithm running on a computer. And that means you can completely change the behavior of your device just by running a different algorithm. The universal audio plugin that models the manly massive passive using DSP that runs on your computer isn't going to have the same vibe as the original hardware, and it's obviously not going to have the same interface. There's something different between turning the knobs on the physical hardware versus turning the knobs on the screen using your mouse and trackpad. But this is a whole lot cheaper, and you can run many, many different copies of it in your digital audio workstation on different tracks. And you can swap this out for a bunch of other different digital signal processing plugins. Okay, now I've just spent nine minutes talking about digital signal processing, but I don't want you to think about this class as a class on digital signal processing. We have ECE 4270, Fundamentals of Digital Signal Processing, which is a traditional senior level class on DSP, like you might find at a lot of other schools. My colleague David Anderson has a bunch of lectures for EC4270 on YouTube under the name DSP Fundamentals, as well as our graduate course EC6250, which is Advanced Digital Signal Processing, and lectures on adaptive filters. So I highly recommend that you check those out. You should think about ECE2026 as a general class on signal and system concepts that are applicable to a wide variety of areas in science and engineering. We just happen to be using DSP and its various applications as a mechanism to explain these ideas. One advantage of starting with digital signal processing instead of analog signal processing is we don't really need a lot of advanced math. Calculus is listed as a prereq, but the only place we ever use it is when we talk about the Fourier series analysis integral. So if you haven't had calculus, you'll still be able to understand most of the course. You need to know and love sines and cosines, basic trigonometry. You need to know about exponential functions. And you need to remember the quadratic formula. We will use complex numbers a lot, but we will review those. One final comment. You may have noticed that AI, this supposed artificial intelligence, has been in the news a lot lately. A lot of the things that companies are calling artificial intelligence are essentially well-known established techniques from traditional digital signal processing that have been rebranded as AI to impress investors. Now, there are truly exciting things happening in machine learning. But anything happening with image processing or speech processing or music, all of that has the techniques of EC2026 sitting at the bottom of it, feeding everything else. A lot of folks seem to get PyTorch or TensorFlow, and they just kind of start hacking. If you really want to understand what's happening underneath, with machine learning where you have a function of space or time, like an image or an audio file, EC2026 is a good place to start. In the next lecture, I'll give you a little preview of some of the things we'll be talking about later in the course. Namely, I'll show you some applications of the discrete Fourier transform, just to provide some motivation for where we're going. After that, we'll start the main meat of the course material, which is to talk about sinusoids.